Hello and welcome to West Country Wanderings. Welcome to episode one of a brand new series, Secrets of the Thames and Severn Canal. Now, a bit like the Secrets of the Stroud Water, we'll be looking at different places of interest and historical facets of this fantastic canal here in Gloucestershire. I'm currently at Lechlade on Thames. I think the on Thames was added by some estate agents in the 1980s, but uh, it was when I was growing up here, it was always just known as simply Lechlade. That there is the River Thames, and behind that is Halfpenny Bridge. So be cold because you used to have to pay halfpenny toll to cross over it. That's the road that goes down to Swindon and up that way towards Burford in Oxfordshire. That ceased in 1839 when there was riots in the town to stop the toll. Because obviously if you lived around here, traveling anywhere about, it could soon mount up. That was abolished, no more have penny tolls. There is a lovely little toll house which sits on the bridge and insert a shot of that now. What's this all got to do with the Thames and Severn Canal? Well, Lechlade on Thames is the start of the Thames and Severn Canal, or the end, depending which way you're coming from. When the Thames and Severn Canal opened, of course, traffic would be coming up the navigable River Severn. It does go on a little bit more navigable, just a little bit beyond Lechlade. There's always a bit of debate how far that is. And the Thames and Severn Canal, of course, enters the river here at Inglesham, which is about another three quarters mile further on, which is where there is a roundhouse. And I covered that on one of my previous Stradwater and Thames and Seven Canal updates. I can't remember what number one that is. I think it was possibly six. And again, when they opened Inglesham Lock, probably around about 10 or 12. I'll put those details in below if you want to have a look at those. But today we're going to have a look at the history of Lechlade itself. Because it's been an inland port, it was an important inland port before the Thames and Severn Canal arrived. And there's some interesting buildings here, wharfside buildings. I'd like to share that with you here on part one of Secrets of the Thames and Severn Canal. Now today, Lechlade on Thames is known with its links to the leisure industry. River Thames here is linked to places like Oxford, Reading and down to London. You won't see any commercial craft carrying freight these days. But that wasn't the case some 300 years ago when over there at a place called Free Wharf, a large warehouse was built and it was actually restored some 30 years ago, one of the finest examples of an inland port warehouse anywhere in the United Kingdom. That predated the Thames and Severn Canal reaching Lechlade on Thames, or rather Inglesham, just a little bit further to the west of where I'm currently standing, by some 80 to 100 years or so. So it's always been an inland port prior to the associations with the Thames and Severn Canal. Now, originally when the Thames and Severn Canal joined the River Thames at Inglesham, they had their own little port provision there. But of course, that wasn't a great location. Access to the roads and onwards to markets is quite difficult at that location. And that's still the case today. It's still quite a tricky place to get via road area around it often floods. It's only recently that the waters receded to allow me to film here as I'm doing this in the middle of a very cold January day in 2024. So they acquired another port, or rather another wharf. So we have Free Wharf in there. We also have Park End Wharf. Now how it became Park End Wharf and was acquired by the Thames and Severn Canal Company in 1813 was because of the associations of what was coming along the canal in terms of freight in West Gloucestershire, the opposite end of Gloucestershire to where I am today, is the Forest of Dean. And they had huge coal fields there, and still there's, but the coal mines have closed. And one of those is Park End Colliery, now more famously known because it's associated with the steam 
Dean Forest Railway, which I've done a couple of video, a few videos, but one specifically looking at Park End. So you want to have a look at what Park End looks like. I'll include a link to that video at the end of this one as well. So yeah, they renamed it Park End Wharf, and then the goods came out of Inglesham Junction there, and then made their way a bit further along the River Thames to join the wharf here, which is just behind where we are. I'm going to have a look at that location a bit later and see if I can insert some shots of it. So coal was brought across from the Forest of Dean. It can then make its way further on a transshipment point, a bit like the one at Brimscombe Point, just a little bit further away from where the Stroud Water Canal joins in Thames and Seven Canal. And then the coal could then be moved on to markets further on in places, like I said, like Oxford, Reading and London. Now the Thames and Severn Canal opened on Thursday, the 19th of November, 1789. And the first transaction of freight actually didn't come from the Forest of Dean, but had come down from Staffordshire, it made its way down the Staffs and Wool Canal through Starpoint on Severn and then down what we're familiar with here on West Country Wanderings, the River Severn and then down through Gloucester and then made its way across along the Stroud Water Canal. One month later after that, a huge celebration took place here in the town of Lechlade. Now the huge celebration actually took place at the New Inn Hotel, which is still going, it's still a hotel here in the marketplace of Lechlade. I'll insert a photograph of it now. And it was at the expense of one Mr. Wells, who was the warfinger here at Lechlade. And he allowed people, all men, women and children from the town to celebrate, to eat and drink as much as they like to celebrate the freight coming down from the West Midlands to this East Gloucestershire town. Now some of that coal ended up in the Cotswell town of Sirencester. Now if you remember my update, Sirencester had its own arm which was dug out of the junction from the canal, should I say, main part of the Thames and Severn Canal. And that coal coming down from the West Midlands actually reduced the price hereabouts and it went from 30 shillings a tonne to 22 shillings a tonne. So there was huge celebrations all around with people paying a lot less for the coal needed to heat their homes and also provide power to the local mills. Now one month after the celebrations took place here in Lechlade of the freight coming down was some more stock in January of 1790. The first Simon of Droitwich Salt arrived. Droitwich Spa, again which I've covered on the town a few times previously. Famously a salt town dating back to Roman times and continuing on into the 18th century was a key place for salt and that had lots of uses. Not in those days, of course, before, prior to refrigeration and people that couldn't afford those ice houses you see in large manor house estates, they had to salt the meat to extend the life of it. So salt was a really important resource and that arrived here in Lechlade well, along the length of the Stradwater and Thames and Severn Canal as I say, in 1790. That was an important trade because previously it had come down what is known as the Salt Way from Droitwich Spa, but by coming my road, it was quite an expensive process and the canal because it could bulk carry goods like salt meant that it reduced the price of that too. But the traffic wasn't going on one way. It wasn't all coming down from the Midlands. Some of the traffic was heading out of this part of Gloucestershire, heading north. And one such item was flagons of cider from Gloucester. 
and that made its way in both directions. The flagons went up into the further reaches of the West and East Midlands. It also came this way along the Thames and Severn Canal because then the people producing cider in and around Gloucester could tap into the London markets. One of the issues though of the canal, the Thames and Severn Canal reaching the Thames here was, was its navigability. Now obviously it's open to the narrowboats that, that come along it. And as I say, it goes on a little bit further in terms of navigation. But it wasn't without its problems. And in 1792, the owners of the Thames and Severn Canal wrote to the Thames, River Thames commissioners because they were concerned about the river being open for navigation, getting the goods coming down and continuing on to London because parts of it weren't navigable. Didn't have locks in those days along the River Thames like we have today. And so they said to them, in order for our freight to continue, get goods going through and paying the dues going on, which they had to, to get it down to market there in London, they needed some more infrastructure in place, particularly locks and accessible towpaths. Now, three years prior to that, the Thames and Severn Canal owners had previously contacted the River Thames commissioners. And in doing so, the River Thames commissioner employed the services of one William Jessop, who identified that they needed to build eight pound locks and 55 wooden bridges across little inlets to provide a continuous towpath so that anything towing the narrowboats thinking here of the horses specifically, could have access freely to the towpath to get it continuously moving along the River Thames. Unfortunately, those locks and towpaths weren't built straight away. So it wasn't until three years later that they advertised a continuous trade from the Midlands to London and vice versa, because the Thames and Severn Canal owners were concerned that how freely that freight will be able to move along good old Father Thames here.
the end of 1792, it's identified that four of those eight pound locks that had been constructed were in a parlour state. Doesn't that sound familiar for the, what we uncovered last time at Ryford Lock on the Stroudwater Canal? And the navigation on the Thames always remained troublesome to the owners of the Thames and Severn Canal. And it wasn't until the construction of the North Wilts Canal, which connected the Thames and Severn Canal at Latton to another canal, the Wilts and Box, which we've also covered here on West Country Wanderings, that it eased the problem because that canal connected to the Thames further downstream at Abingdon upon Thames, where the navigation was a lot easier and freer towards the capital city. We'll actually be exploring the North Wilts Canal in both one of my secrets of the TNS and also one of my Wilts and Barks Canal series. That'll be coming up in the next few weeks. Freight here at this magnificent inland port of Lechlade on Thames was still significant despite the navigational problems of the Thames between here and Oxford. Some stock still got through, although there were often delays, as I said, because of the problems of the pound locks and the river being blocked off for dredging and associated works. Today, of course, now that the Thames and Severn closed many, many years ago in the 1930s, this has gone being back to a sleepy Cotswold town here in Gloucestershire, but still a favourite town for people coming to explore the Cotswolds. And if people own the boat in the southeast, they'll often pop along here in the summer up the Thames to explore the delights of this part of the Cotswolds. I hope you enjoyed this first episode of The Secrets of the Thames and Seven Canal here on West Country Wanderings. There'll be another one in this series and also another one in The Secrets of the Stroudwater series in the not too distant future. So if you like that sort of thing, please consider hitting the subscribe and the notification bell to alert you to when that happens. Until then, all the best. Bye bye.